Well, Professor Fred Singer, thank you so very much for taking the time to, uh, to talk with me today. Now, your honorarium is astonishing. Your accomplishments across your career are, are broad ranging and I can't hope to introduce you by mentioning everything that you've done because I would spend the entire interview talking about your achievements. But here are just a few uh, of your, your, the highlights of your achievements. You achieved a PhD in physics. You've uh, been a director of the Centre for Atmospheric and, Spa and Space Physics. You were the first director of the National Weather Satellite Service. You've held positions within the EPA. You've held positions within the Department of the Interior. You were the vice chairman of the National Advisory Committee for Oceans and Atmosphere. Uh, you were a professor on the Cosmic Dust and Orbital Debris Project, a chief scientist for the US Department of Transport, uh, and you've also been a professor of environmental science and a research professor as well. And those are just a few of your achievements. So, Professor, thank you very much for taking the time to, to speak with me. Very good to be here. Fantastic. Now, to call yours a distinguished career is an understatement. You've had more than just a distinguished career. Today, you were with the non-governmental International Panel on Climate Change. A lot of people have never heard of the non-governmental Panel on Climate Change. You've just returned from China, and thank you again because you flew in from China two days ago, and I'm sure you're still recovering from the, the time zone difference. You've just returned from China where you've been involved in some high-level meetings and some high-level discussions on climate change and climate change policy. So let's start there. Professor, what is the non-governmental international panel on climate change, and why were you in China representing them? The NIPCC is something that several of us set up about five years ago uh, in response to the UN's IPCC, which is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Mm -hmm. uh, we were concerned that the IPCC was ignoring contrary evidence to their conclusion. Their conclusion, of course, is that man-made global warming was uh, catastrophic and was going to cause all kinds of problems. We don't share that view. Uh, we therefore uh, surveyed the literature just as IPCC does and partic paid particular attention to the uh, published papers, all peer reviewed, that they had ignored, which go contrary to their evidence. We show, for example, that the sun is the major actor in climate change and other natural forcings are much more important than any human influence on climate. We've written now three books on this uh, in 2008, 2009, 2011 and are finally coming up with our summary volume later this year. Uh, these are essentially in response to the IPCC and uh, will state our conclusions forthrightly. Uh, the Chinese Academy of Sciences has decided to translate our books into Chinese and invited us to present our conclusions at a workshop. They do not necessarily endorse what we're doing. Obviously, they're, they're keeping their distance, but they will study what we've done, and I hope that they will reach the right conclusion. So, Professor, you mentioned there that there are studies which show a conclusion different to the one that the IPCC presents. That may come as a surprise to some people. What are some of these studies and, and what do they show? The conclusion of the IPCC, just to get that out of the way, is that uh, the release of greenhouse gases, primarily carbon dioxide, is causing dangerous climate change. Our conclusion is quite different. We do not we look at the data, actual observations, and find that they do not agree with the model calculation. The IPCC puts much of their faith into the model calculations. We prefer to look at the actual observations. Mm -hmm. And we find that there is strong disagreement between models and observations. And in that case, as scientists, we tend to accept the observations, the atmospheric facts. Models are constructs by humans, and they only represent what you put into them. Obviously, if you leave out certain forcings in the models, you will not get the right answers. 
So what are some of the observations that we've been seeing that don't agree with the IPCC's we've models? We've paid particular attention to the observations done by weather satellites, uh, partly because of my own background, but mainly because weather satellites observe all of the Earth without any interruption from North Pole to South Pole and back, unlike weather stations which are located only on land and are spaced and are subject to various errors. Naturally, the satellite observations also require certain corrections, but these have been made. And independently of the satellite data, we also have balloon observations with radio sounds that agree with the satellite data. So we're pretty sure that the satellite data of atmospheric temperature, global atmospheric temperature, are the correct data of what is happening in the atmosphere. And what's that data telling you? It shows essentially little, if any, warming from 1978 mm -hmm. to the end of the century. Mm -hmm. Then a jump, which cannot be blamed on humans. It's a sudden jump, in upward jump in temperature, mm -hmm. produced per, or correlated with a change in ocean circulation. And then, again, no change in temperature, no increase in the last uh, at least 10 years. Mm -hmm. Some say in the last 15 years. I will give it, uh, I'll be conservative and say at least in the last 10 years, which is completely contrary to all the models. Right. The models all predict major increases in temperature because the models obviously assume that the increase in carbon dioxide is causing a temperature increase. Right. So what does that mean for places like Australia where we've introduced a carbon tax uh, ostensibly in order to try and stop climate change? Places like the European Union where they've introduced an emissions trading scheme and now here in the US where we're recording this interview where Barack Obama has just indicated that he plans to introduce and push through measures to try and stop climate change. If you're correct and CO2 is not the guilty party, what does that mean? Well, it means it's a tremendous waste, of, not only of effort, but of money and resources. It is not addressing the right problems. In fact, climate change by itself is not a problem. Climate is always changing, and we simply have to learn to adapt to natural climate changes. There's nothing we can do about this. I know it's very hard to convince politicians that there's nothing they can do about natural changes, but I always like to use the ocean tides. Mm. Uh, there's nothing we can do to stop the tides. Uh, there's nothing that we can do to stop earthquakes. There's very little we can do to stop volcanoes. Mm. These are natural events. We seem to be, have to be prepared for them. Mm. Some of them, of course, are damaging and dangerous, but most of them are not. For example, uh, a future warming may be beneficial. Certainly, the increased carbon dioxide levels are beneficial for agriculture. Uh, as you know, carbon dioxide is plant food, natural fertilizer, and makes plants grow better and faster. You're, you've been involved in this uh, issue, the issue of climate change, since, since it began in the public mind, since 1988 and even before. Uh, you were once a, in, a, at a high level in the Environmental Protection Agency and you've, your environmental credentials are, are quite well established. So it would come as a surprise to some people to find someone like yourself disagreeing with the orthodoxy or disagreeing with the view that, the, the, that climate change is serious and that it's man-made and that it's going to cause us problems. When and how did you first begin to come to the conclusion that the orthodoxy, that the IPCC may not be correct? That's a good question. Uh, let me see. I've been an atmospheric scientist since my degrees were awarded, so that's uh, since about 1948. Um, I entered the environmental air field in 1967 uh, to fight a water pollution, which in the United States was very real, and then air pollution. Uh, we've accomplished a great deal. Uh, we now have a fairly clean environment and uh, good conditions in rivers and lakes, which didn't exist 
uh, let's say, 40 years ago. So now things are very much better. The matter of climate change is something that's concerned me for about uh, 40 years, but I really became actively involved only after the IPCC and other alarmists started to publish their conclusions. And I became alarmed at their alarmist conclusions because they were giving us the wrong answers. How did you know at the time, on what did you, at the time, did you base your view that they were giving the wrong answers? I think uh, it was the satellite data that first convinced me that there was something wrong with the IPCC. The satellite data starting in 1978 have shown no temperature increase until the end of the century. That became evident after 10 years of satellite data. Uh, and of course, 10 years is not long enough. Uh, after 15 years of satellite data, I finally published a book called Hot Talk, Cold Science. And even then people said 15 years is not long enough. Well, you see, uh, that kind of argument can carry you uh, nowhere, uh, because what is long enough? 20 years, 30 years, 50 years? It depends on what you're trying to prove. The IPCC seems to think that for their purposes to demonstrate a human influence on climate, 10 years is long enough. Uh, but they resent the fact that we reach a different conclusion even after a data of 20 years. Mm. So you could be regarded as one of the earliest skeptics, so to speak. You were publishing books before a lot of other people who are now regarded as skeptics uh, were even known of. How have you been treated within the scientific community, within, within the media, within, public, within the public space? What's been your treatment as a result of the position you've taken? Unfortunately, one should never be an early skeptic. <laughs> uh, it, it is, um, you're treated as a pariah by your fellow scientists, many of whom depend on government grants for their research. And you treat, you're ridiculed by the media. And of course, people like Al Gore uh, will say nasty things about you. So one sh I, my advice to a young man is be a skeptic, but don't be an early skeptic. <laughs> Well, skepticism, of course, is a necessary part of science. A scientist must almost, by definition, be skeptical and always be assessing and reassessing what they see in front of them. How come we have so many scientists today who are accepting the conclusions of models and the conclusions of computer you know, models rather than the sorts of things that you're talking about, the empirical science, the measured science? How come we have so many scientists trusting models over actual data? You know, many scientists are really not specialists in this area. And even so-called specialists really don't take the time to actually look at the real data. They tend to take them on faith. Uh, they're impressed by the fact that the IPCC claims to be the work of 2,500 scientists. Uh, Literally, this is not true. Uh, they include, of course, all of the reviewers, of which I'm one. I've re I'm an official reviewer of their reports, so I get their advanced drafts, review them, make my comments, and hope that they will pay attention to them. They usually don't. <laughs> so, what happens now? If you're, you're here with the non-governmental inter international panel on climate change and you say that you'll be presenting some conclusions and a summary of conclusions later this year, we have on the other side the IPCC who are expected to release AR5, their fifth um, assessment report later this year, which is expected to continue on their previous trend of blaming man's carbon dioxide emissions for, for climate change. We have two competing fields of thought here. How do we resolve this? How, how can the public come to a conclusion one way or the other? That's a very good issue. Um, I have already reviewed two drafts, mm -hmm. the first and the second draft of the fifth report, which is due in September of this year. Mm -hmm. So I know their weak points. Right. I can tell you that their so-called evidence 
to support their conclusion of anthropogenic, that is human-caused global warming, this evidence is very, very skimpy. It really doesn't even exist. Can you give um, some examples? Now, to explain that to the public, it's rather difficult. It consists of trying to show that the models and observations do not agree. The simplest way to convince the public, and apparently this is getting through, mm -hmm. is to just uh, repeat the fact that there has been no observed warming, even from surface thermometers, mm -hmm. in at least 10 years, mm -hmm. and maybe as much as 17 years. Mm -hmm. The public believe, will accept that, mm -hmm. and I think this is one of the strong arguments we can use against the IPCC. Now, of course, that lack of warming has happened at the same time as we've continued to see rising atmospheric carbon dioxide. There, we're seeing more and more carbon dioxide levels in the, in the atmosphere. Yeah. In fact, increasing even faster thanks to the Chinese, which are building many coal-fired power plants. Let's talk about the Chinese for a moment, because certainly in Australia, which is where I know best, We've had a lot of people saying that the Chinese are leading the way in the fight against climate change. They would have us believe that the Chinese are reducing their carbon emissions uh, and are in fact ahead of the rest of the world in that process. You're hands on, you've been there, you've seen with your own eyes. What is happening in China? They're not reducing their carbon emission. Their carbon emissions are increasing. Mm -hmm. uh, they should reduce their carbon emission, but only by increasing the efficiency of their power plants. Mm -hmm. The efficiency of their power plants right now is about 11%, which is extremely low compared to the best power plants we can build in the United States, which have an efficiency of 50%. Even our old power plants have an efficiency of 35%, which is three times better than what the general Chinese plant is doing. But they can retrofit their plants, but this takes time and money and they're too busy right now uh, looking after economic growth. But they will, of course, uh, retrofit their plants and improve their efficiency. And therefore, they will start to emit less carbon dioxide in the future. Uh, this is simply a matter of economics, of using their coal resources more efficiently. And that should be applauded. The fact that they're emitting carbon dioxide, however, is a good thing for the world and we should thank them for it because it is helping world agriculture. Remember that carbon dioxide is a natural plant fertilizer and in fact it is greening the earth. Have we observed that? Crop yields. How, 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 do you, how do you back that statement that it's greening the earth, that it's improving crop yields? That statement is backed by hundreds of agricultural scientists. I'm not one of those so I cannot speak from personal knowledge. Mm -hmm. However, my co-author, mm -hmm. Craig Inso, is an agricultural scientist and biologist, mm -hmm. and he has produced a special study of this. Mm -hmm. His father, in fact, pioneered some of the early experiments. And we know that people who operate greenhouses inject more carbon dioxide into the greenhouse atmosphere to promote a better operation of the greenhouse. So for purely economic reasons, you want more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Also, uh, from a historic reason, you should remember that our major food crops, that's wheat and rice and maize, all developed about, oh, maybe three to 5,000, uh, well, uh, when carbon dioxide levels were between three and 5,000 parts per million, which is about, let's say, 10 times the present value. So they really are used to higher CO2 levels. They want more CO2 levels. They're crying out to us, please give us more CO2. After all, we're returning the CO2 which we took from the atmosphere, put into fossil fuels. We're now returning it to the atmosphere. That's an interesting point, the fact that these fossil fuels, coal, oil, shale, gas, these organic-based fuels come from plants which did previously take their, um, their 
fuel, take carbon dioxide from yeah, the they atmosphere. Took, all, all of this carbon dioxide essentially came from carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, in the ancient atmosphere, and we're returning it at this time. So does that mean that the ancient world was a lot hotter than we are now? Can we go back into the record and see that because they had more CO2, they also had extremely high temperatures? Um, the correlation is not perfect. In fact, there is no real correlation. However, there were warm periods and there have been cold periods. These correlate more with the way the solar system moved through our galaxy which is a com completely different issue, has nothing to do with carbon dioxide, uh, but has a lot to do with what exists in galactic arms, mm -hmm. namely in increased intensity of cosmic rays. Right. Apparently, that factor is an important one in changing the climate. Professor, we're told constantly in the media and by the IPCC and by different organizations we're told that different things that we see around the world are proof of global warming, proof that climate change is happening. And these are things like Hurricane Sandy and other storms that we've seen. Uh, everything from, from sea level rise, the reduction in polar bears, the reduction in, in ice levels in the Arctic. We, we are told that there are a lot of things that we can look at and see climate change happening before our very eyes. You're obviously not convinced. So how do you respond to these things that we, that we can see? I go back to the IPCC report. Right. Um, they are concerned about providing evidence for their conclusion about man-made global warming. Mm -hmm. They don't discuss, they have a special chapter on this. Mm -hmm. It doesn't discuss any of these things. The only thing that uh, really they discuss is a, an alleged agreement between morals and observations temperature observations right. with thermometers. That's the thing to focus on. Everything else doesn't tell you anything about an actual warming. For example, if a glacier is melting, mm -hmm. you cannot tell from this what the cause is. Right. It could be natural, it could be man-made, it could be something else. Mm -hmm. uh, in any case, it, is, it doesn't tell you as much as a thermometer. In other words, don't use glaciers as thermometers. Right. So how do you respond then? Let's take sea level rise as an example. Um, sea level rise is a, is a good example of what not to use. Right. And I'll tell you why. A sea level uh, has risen historically by about 120 meters, that's 400 feet, in the last 18,000 years. That is, since the lowest point of the last ice age, when it started to warm, and uh, it is entirely due to the melting of ice that existed during the ice age. At one time, for example, you didn't have a North Sea. You could walk from England to France. So sea level has risen uh, very markedly in the last millennia. In fact, it is still rising, but rising much more slowly now. It's been rising at about the rate of about 18 centimeters per century, that's seven inches per century, for the last, um, I would say, two or 3,000 years. We have good data on that data from corals and other observations. The rise is probably due not so much to a warming of the climate as the fact that it is warmer now than it was 18,000 years ago. And some ice, for example, ice in the Antarctic, melts very, very slowly. It takes thousands of years for the ice there to realize that it's warmer than it used to be. And I think that's the answer. So you're of the view that the Earth is still finding equilibrium after changes that happened long before we have records. Right. right. And uh, in my view, sea level will continue to rise no matter what we do mm. at the same rate of about seven inches per century until the next ice age, which may not be very long in coming. And when the next ice age starts, uh, more of the ocean water will freeze and become ice, 
and sea level will fall back down to what it was during the last ice age. So we expect sea level to drop uh, slowly first, then more rapidly as the ice age progresses. So I know we've covered this already to one degree or another, but I'd like to make clear you're, you believe it's possible for us to enter another ice age in spite of the CO2 that we're putting into the atmosphere, in spite of what the IPCC would tell us will cause global warming. You believe that it's entirely possible for us to head for another ice age. That's a very good issue uh, worthy of discussion. It's a, it's a scientific issue. Uh, we know from historic data that during the last two million years, there have been about 17 ice ages. Uh, they're called, technically called glaciations. These last over the order of 100,000 years. And I, in between ice ages, you have short periods of interglacial warming. We're now in a period of interglacial warming called the Holocene. And these interglacial warmings typically last 10 to 15,000 years. The present interglacial has now been going on for about 10,000 years. So many people think that we're due for another ice age very soon. We don't know when, but it could be in a thousand years or in a few hundred years, or maybe in a few thousand years. Uh, it's hard to predict. So what would drive these 17 ice ages over, this, over the relatively recent past? What's driving those if uh, it's not? That we, we, we do know. Mm -hmm. uh, the regularity of the ice ages mm -hmm. uh, leads to pe people to think that they're of astronomical origin. Right. And in fact, uh, there is a theory called the astronomical theory of ice ages, mm -hmm. which seems to work fairly well. It uh, gives the right dates for the onset and disappearance of ice ages, mm -hmm. and it's based on the fact that the Earth undergoes regular motions around the Sun. Mm -hmm. For example, the orbit of the Earth is not perfectly circular, it's elliptic, mm -hmm. and the eccentricity of this ellipse varies with a period of about oh, 20,000 years. Mm -hmm. Also, the tilt of the Earth is now 23 degrees. It, it also varies uh, with a period of thousands of years. And the uh, tilt of the Earth rotates in space, again with a certain period. And we observe all of these periods in the ice ages. So the astronomical theory seems to work in explaining the onset of ice ages. Of the details of just how an ice age starts and why and why it stops is not really known. That is still a matter of scientific debate. Bringing ourselves, ourselves back very much into the present, uh, we've talked about the distant past, we've talked about what might happen in the future. Right now we have governments who are imposing carbon taxes, we have environmental agencies who are uh, imposing green schemes, with there's been a real rush towards wind energy and solar energy and alternative energy sources that don't require the burning of fossil fuels. Is there a purpose to any of this? There are some people who would say that all of this is good even if climate change isn't happening. That better energy sources, renewable energy sources, these sorts of things are still a good thing even if they're not helping us with, with climate change. Is that true? Uh, it depends. These so-called renewable sources like solar and wind, mm -hmm. uh, in principle, they work. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't work well. They're, unfortunately, they're intermittent. Mm -hmm. The wind sources only work when the wind blows. And the s solar sources only work when the sun shines. So obviously, they don't work at night. Uh, this means that they are rather expensive, uh, that you need to provide storage of energy if you want to have electric power at the say, flip of a switch. Uh, on the other hand, if you're doing things like uh, lifting water for irrigation, or if you're grinding grain and you can grind it any time the wind blows, that's okay. 
So for certain niche applications, solar and wind are fine. But in general, uh, they are not economic. Now, as far as energy policies are concerned, as I've mentioned, the, any effort to uh, decrease CO2 emissions is bound to fail. It's expensive and it will not produce any climate effects that we can notice. It should in principle, because carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas, uh, so the models predict that it will do something, but in reality, the atmosphere doesn't seem to show these uh, consequences. So I notice, for example, that all of the efforts so far have failed. For example, uh, in the United States, uh, Obama in 2009 tried to pass a uh, so-called cap-and-trade bill for carbon dioxide. The Congress would not approve it. In Europe, cap-and-trade has been tried and it's been a tremendous failure, a real disaster. In Australia, they have introduced a carbon tax. My understanding is that they will soon phase it out because it isn't working in producing the results that they hoped for. It certainly is not having any effect on climate. In California, which is a, one of our, our more interesting states, uh, they, will, they have passed a law to introduce a cap and trade scheme. Uh, we will all watch it with great interest. It will be very, very expensive. In fact, uh, it is not really a climate measure, even in California, it's simply a tax. Another tax imposed on the population of the state of California, in addition to a very high income tax and other taxes, because they are spending money like drunken sailors. It's a phrase we use. Anyway, the cap and trade effort in California will be worth watching for the whole world because it will be the only one that will be in operation. Uh, it will uh, be a real disaster, that's my prediction. Well, Professor, this has been a real pleasure for me and I, I thank you very much for giving me your time and, uh, and having this conversation with me. Before we finish, is there any, is there, are there any final thoughts you'd like to leave us with on the whole subject of climate change? Well, I would only say that climate change is natural, has been going on for, since the beginning of the Earth, it will continue, and all we should do is learn how to adapt to it in the best possible way. Professor, thank you very much. Thank you.